Today we're making backwards blueberry mead. Okay, you're probably curious what I mean by backwards blueberry mead. Well, but a year ago, we did this. And this is what it tasted like after a year. This mead is one year old. Let's taste it. This is our blueberry mead. This is, yeah, it's uh, one year old, 10.8% and it finished at 1.010. It smells wonderful. It smells like blueberry wine. Yeah, it really does. I'm, I'm going in. Okay. The honey character is like in the middle. It's not up, up front, it comes in in the middle. Not overly powerful honey character, but it's there. Like it's giving a good support backbone yep. to the yep. fruit. And the finish is kind of short. Um, it's not overly sweet, it's not overly dry. I'm gonna think this was a, I'm gonna, somebody's gonna tell me I'm wrong, but I think this was a non-fermentable sugar. I think it was. It feels like this could have been erythritol. Minty. Yeah, there's a slight thing. off flavor there. It's not amazing. It's not blowing my doors off. I think there's a little, little funk. Decided not to play nice and didn't want to meld with the other flavors. 10.8%. It's kind of on the lower yeah. end. It's not, so it's not I, super high alcohol. I like it. I don't love it. I, I don't hate it though, either. It's not, uh, it's not in my top 10 list. The first few notes, the first expression, is beautiful. It is fantastic, in yeah. my opinion. It's just once you get to that midpoint and you get that little discordant note in there, but see, the, if you if you force yourself to ignore the bad stuff and focus on the good stuff, the berry is very nice in the beginning. One, two, three, five. six point five. Wow. The, the, that discordant is just really messing with me and mm. it's it's making me not enjoy the beginning, which is so lovely. And I really want to enjoy the beginning, but my brain doesn't work that way. My brain wants to find what's wrong and fix it. We interrupt this video to bring you something completely different. Okay, you're probably curious what I mean by backwards blueberry mead. Well, there's a lot of different ways to make mead, especially like you want to make a fruit mead. You can use whole fruit, you can use juice, you can put it in primer, you can put it in conditioning, you can put it in both, you can do all, all sorts of things. We've done multiple experiments on this and I will link those results in the description below. What we have found is that if you put fruit in front primary versus conditioning, it really doesn't change much except that you get more of a little bit of a brighter fruity, yeah I can talk, a little bit of a brighter fruitier flavor when you put it into conditioning. It's also easier to control how much flavor you're adding. So we're going to go step by step through a very basic way of making a mead with ultimate control along the way. So we have three pounds of wildflower honey. Whose honey is this then? This, this is, is Sweet Scoop. Sweet, sweet squeeze. squeeze. Try saying that three times sweet fast. Squeeze. We'll have links to all the stuff that we use in the description below. They can all be got from Amazon. That's where we got it. But basically, if you can find a local wildflower honey, that will work just as well. We went with wildflower because of its aromatics and the floral essences that shouldn't conflict too much with a blueberry. Whereas like an orange blossom might, you know, that orange might just conflict with the blueberry a little bit, should be a little bit tart and the orange flavor with blueberry doesn't seem to work for me. Clover honey would also be another great option. Yes, I agree. So you want something on the neutralish side. No honey is truly neutral, but you know, as close as you can get. So three pounds, that's the important thing, three pounds. So to that, what are we gonna add? Oh, I have the recipe. Notes. We probably want to start adding water at this point. Right. We are going to use 96 ounces of water. We're using a little big mouth bubbler fermenter because there's a large addition that's going to happen after fermentation. So we want to have some space. So 96 ounces of water, please. The final front. <sighs> the reason we're using 96 ounces of water is because three pounds of honey takes up roughly 32 ounces or a quart. So we're adding three quarts or 96 ounces of water to make a full gallon. That's important, but not super uber critical. If you had a little bit more, a little bit less, it's not that big of a deal. And now we need to mix. And for that, I'm going to need my spoon of unusual size. Okay, I have two of these now. <laughs> Drew sent me a second one. He yeah. thought it was a smaller one, but <laughs> this, it's the same, it's size. the same size. It's the exact same thing that we already had, but it's okay. It's the thought that counts. But you know, it's funny, there's actually a mark right here. I think I'm just gonna cut it right there and then I'll have a spoon of normal size. That's so not fun. But anyway, and I'm just going to, she put a string on it so she can, put a can string hang on it. it. Okay, we have this. We've very, got a little house, okay? And so our, our, our fancy smancy nail in the wall 
that holds our spoons of unusual size and our pizza peel of unusual size. I have an awesome pizza peel. Brian has a thing about pizza. Let's just put it that. And so this, this second spoon of unusual spot size needed a string in order to fit on our fancy smancy nail. It did not need this long of a string to fit on our fancy schmancy peel. I was unsupervised when I was yeah. stringing the spoon. What can I say? Okay, I am mixing this up and I am not being prissy about it. I am okay with getting air in there and getting it all sloppy. I just don't Why want to Why is it... that, Brian? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's in a mood today. Um, it's because in the beginning of fermentation, you want some aeration, you want oxygen. The yeast need to build up a colony in the beginning and they do that with oxygen and that comes from the air. Once alcohol is present, you do not want any more oxygen because that's when acetobacters can be activated and they take the oxygen and the alcohol and they turn it into vinegar. So you don't want to do that. So before alcohol, oxygen good. After alcohol, Oxygen, bad. They're not in kindergarten. They, they gotta be drinking age in order to be <laughs> interested in this. <laughs> it's okay. No, I was doing- We are just coming off of a couple of tastings, bad. just so you know, so yeah. Uh, we don't need excuses, I'm wacky regardless. This is true. We didn't have that much alcohol anyway. I did have some whiskey in a video though. You did. I did, not a lot. Now, if you mix this thoroughly, you'll get an accurate first reading. If you don't mix this thoroughly, you'll get an inaccurate first reading. Does it really matter? No, it just means that your ABV calculation later on might be eh, questionable. So I'm just trying to get it as close as possible. We should get a 1.105 reading at the end. I'm hoping it comes out to that. Every honey is a little bit different, but I think the sweet squeeze was pretty much spot on. And so that's a good note for you to take it home if you are not using the same honey that we're using, which is completely fine and okay. Just remember that your initial, your first gravity reading may be different than ours, simply because your particular honey may have a different gravity reading than ours does. Is that bad or good? No, it's just different. That's all. It's just a thing. Sometimes a thing is just a thing. And sometimes a string is in my way. <laughs> I'm gonna cut it to like here, so I have just enough to put my hand on it. Yeah. Cause that's all I need. That's it, That exactly that. All right, then we can put a little mark the sharpie and can... My rule of thumb for mixing, when you think you've mixed enough, go like another minute or two. I think this is looking pretty good though. Every drop counts. Every last drop is sacred. All right, do you want me to just hold this? Yeah, cause I'm gonna need it again. Add the fermade O mixture. Next is fermado. Now we often say that this is optional. I don't really think it's optional anymore. I think it's it's not necessarily mandatory. It's option mandatory. Oh. Optionatory. Optionatory. <laughs> There's the word of the day. The reason being is that at this point, all we're really doing is Fermenting water, honey. yeast, and honey. So there's not much there. There's not much there for the yeast to be happy about. So Fermido is going to help with that. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Yeast, just like people, need nutrients, not just sugar. We live on glucose too, just like they live on sugars. But they also need other minerals and vitamins in order to survive. This adds a little bit of that, one of them being nitrogen. That's a big thing. And it's just two and a half grams of Fermido in a little tiny bit of water. We're just going to mix that through. Once that's in, the next ingredient, this is optional, but going to improve your brew significantly. If you do not want to use a powder, you can totally just use one cup of your favorite black tea. I'm not going to get specific because they all work. This is actually wine tannin. It's made from, basically it's oak extract. I think it's literally like charred up oak that they grind into a powder, okay? So what it does is it adds tannins. It adds mouthfeel, complexity, depth, to the brew. Tan tea from tannin, tannins from tea can do much the same thing. We actually did a test on that. There wasn't a lot of difference. The main difference is consistency and predictability. I know if I use a half teaspoon of this, what it's going to be like versus a cup of tea. I'm hoping I didn't steep it 30 seconds longer than last time. Get the idea? So if you are consistent in your tea making, you're going to have consistent results as long as you use the same tea and you do exactly the same thing each time. The also thing you want to, do to take into consideration if you're using the tea method is that the additional water that the tea adds to this will 
dilute the sugar if you use the exact same type of water. So if right. you so reduce you the less amount of water. water based on how much tea you're adding, then you're good to go. You need to mix that again. Oh, I thought we didn't mix the tannin because it gooped. It goops anyway, but I, I don't want it just sitting there. Get it in there. Get it in your home. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do on this, because we're nearing the completion of the initial process, and I know what you're saying. There's no blueberry in there. We know. But the next thing is we're gonna take a gravity reading just to verify those numbers, make sure that we're where we think we are. And I, I it's mixed. It's good. Well, I got a goober on my spoon now. I don't know, it sounds like a personal problem. There. Ah. Gotta get violent. Violence is the answer. I said it. Whatever. That goober, see that little spot right there? Just... Not going in. He is not going to fulfill his destiny. <laughs> Let me have the reading equipment, please. Okay. Okay, to take a reading, use a cylinder and a hydrometer. And, well, we're using the master baster, which is really just a turkey baster. We just call it a fancy name. And you stick it in there, pour some sample in until it floats. Make sure it is floating. That's critical, because if it's not floating, you're not really getting a reading. And I'm estimating, I estimated this should come out to 1.105, and it is 1.108. I'm gonna call that close enough. So I'm taking a note. Okay, 1.108, that gives it an approximate 13.5 to 14% potential alcohol when it goes dry. That's important to know because we are actually gonna be diluting this at the end. So we wanna be careful with how much alcohol we make. I wanted this to end up somewhere around 10 to 11, maybe even 12%. Now, that's important. Too many times we gloss over the amount of alcohol we're making and we say it's because we don't wanna stress the yeast and things like that. You have to remember, ethanol is a flavor, okay? More alcohol in a brew does change the flavor. We have proof of that with, oops. I'll get into that in a second. Next thing we need to do is add yeast. What kind of yeast are we using? We're using Red Star Premier Classic. And why are we using Red Star Premier Classic? Well, let me get out my data sheet here so I can tell you. But before all the she gets good to that, things. these are terrible packets, which means they're not terrible, which means I have to use scissors. Drew, the same guy that sent me the spoon of unusual size, sent me some left-handed scissors that actually work really, really nice. In and red. In red, just for me, so I can tear open packages on screen. How much of this yeast am I gonna use? All of it. Can you use half if you want? Sure. Can you try to measure out a fifth if you want? Sure. But just remember, every time you go down, you are diminishing the idea or the possibility of a robust colony. So I like to just use a full packet, whether I'm making one gallon, three gallons, or five gallons. So the data sheet on Red Star Premier Classic Wait. reads... Back your packet. There's a couple extra. Data sheet, yes, go. A strong fermenter with good alcohol tolerance that is useful in producing dry, full-bodied red and white wines. We'll leave a wine with intense color, that was my trigger word, first one, and excellent flavor, trigger word, second one, complexity while preserving tannin content. This yeast will produce hydrogen sulfide gas in the presence of excess sulfur compounds and therefore should not be used to ferment grapes that contain residual sulfur dust. Okay. We're not doing that, so we don't have to worry about that. Right. And that's important. Some of the things that are in there are for wines, okay? You have to remember. So you're kind of playing the game of what works for mead, what works for wine, even though, in my opinion, they're much the same, but they do use a different base component as the sugar. So you got to remember that. So... This yeast's ideal temperature range is 59 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll be at about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which Seven. is like smack in Good. the middle. And its alcohol tolerance is 13%. 13%. Oh, yes. okay. I thought it was 15. 13, as the note states. Oh, okay. Well, let's hope it gets to 13% because we have enough in here to actually get 13.5 or 14%. Now, as Brian likes to say frequently, yeast can't read. So, what percentage will it get to? Only they know. By the way, if you heard R2G2, that was my phone. Somebody just left me a voicemail. <laughs> you probably didn't hear it though. Um, I don't tend to mix the yeast. I'm just going to give it a little bit of a... Wiggle there's, wiggle? Yeah, there's a couple of clumps in there. It will get in there. It's all fine. Um, you could literally just dump everything right in here and it's still going to work. Um, you just don't get the uh, advanced warnings of the readings and things like that. So next we're going to put a lid on it. I was talking about something important. But... Yeah, you were. 
derailed and then I, said, I derailed oh, myself. My, you, you don't want to do that. You don't ever, ever want to do that. Yeah, you'll never now get I don't back remember. there. Well, I'm going to go off on a different tangent. The way we are constructing this, we get control. I said that in the beginning. And what I mean by that is right now, we are just making a must, a simple need that could be flavored a million different ways. We happen to be adding blueberry later, and I'll explain how that's going to work later. But we're also going to keep an open mind to sweetness levels, acidity levels, tannin levels, things like that. So we can balance this as we go. So first, we want to complete fermentation. We want to make a basic starter mead. Just something very simple to work with that we can add flavors and other enhancers to down the line. So we have the lid on it, put an airlock on it, and then what are we going to do with it? You know, that's it. Probably a couple weeks. Let this ferment out. Once we see very little to no airlock activity, which is probably going to be two to three weeks, we'll, we'll be take back our to first check, and we'll show you what it looks like then. So it's been a couple weeks. Time to take a reading. So airlock activity was down to a crawl, down to basically nothing. We had given this a couple of swirls. Just want to give this the olfactory an apical. Optical? Optical. <laughs> Optical observation. It smells like a mead. Does not smell like blueberries. <laughs> which is probably a good thing because we yeah, haven't put any in yet. But it does, it does look right, it smells right, so now we need to take a reading. Oh, I don't have this stuff. <laughs> so it's interesting. It hasn't really started clearing yet, but I do believe it's close to being done, if not totally done. Okay, this was started at 1.108, and right now. Uh, Look at that. It's actually sitting at 1.020. That means it possi it's possible that it stalled. Looking at it, I don't really see a lot of bubble activity. So you know what we're going to do? Yeast stalls, give it a stir. Whenever we think we have a stall, which this may be stalled, because we don't have two readings, we don't know for a fact, but after this amount of time with that little airlock activity, I think it needs a little kickstart. So what we like to do, our first line of defense is one teaspoon of yeast hulls, not fermato yeast hulls, because it doesn't need the nitrogen from what I understand. It just needs a little extra motivation and a good stir. We did notice that this was pretty gassy when we took our sample and the excess gas not being released from the solution could, in fact, be the reason why it slowed down in the first place. Mm -hmm. Look at all that foam. That's oh, yeah. all the gas being released from the solution. So simply doing that could wow. have jump-started this. That, that's an amazing amount of gas. Yeast don't like to swim in their own waste, and their waste products are the alcohol and CO2. So if this was overloaded with gas, there's a reason why it could have stalled. Yeah. Um, we're also starting to see that there's a reason we like 71B yeast, you know? We just really didn't have these kind of problems. But it's okay. This is part of home brewing. Um, you're gonna have things that don't go exactly as planned, things that don't work exactly the way you want them to. How to get around that and get past it is really the key to home brewing. Now, one other thing that I will say, if this really did just stay at that 1.020 mark, and that's all it was ever gonna do, that's totally okay, because the trick to this is we're going to back sweeten this anyway. So if that's the sweetness level we want, we just pasteurize and now it's safe. It's the same thing as if it went dry and we added sugars to it. So don't think of a stall always as a failure. Think of it as it's a stopping point. But I see a stall as an unsafe stopping point because it's kind of like a time bomb. And what I mean by that is if it's whatever level it's stalled at, what if conditions changed? It got warmer, it got colder, it got disturbed. Somehow a protein chain formed just right and caused the right conditions for the yeast to start back up again. You now have live yeast with fermentable sugars. That's a bad combination. They can cause excess gas in a bottle, say it's bottled, and cause them to uh, burst, you, which you do not want to have. So my thinking is if you ever get Whoops. If you ever get to a point where a stall has happened and you t you like the way it tastes, pasteurize it. Let it sit for a few more days and then bottle it. Now it's safe. Now that stall just became part of the plant. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. So I'm several minutes into doing the degassing process and it's still foaming up. That tells me, yeah, it was way gassy, probably far more than the yeast could really tolerate. 
and that is going to be part of the problem. So I'm just going to degas this a little bit more, put the airlock back on, put it back on the shelf, and we'll see in another week or two. It's been seven days. We added yeast holes. It was at 1.020 last time. Let's find out where it is now. But first, a visual inspection and an olfactory inspection. It smells like mead. Okay. So for those of you that don't understand what I mean by is it done and did it do anything, gravity readings start higher at the beginning of fermentation and they go lower as fermentation goes through. Ideally, we like ours to go dry or about 1.000. This one was at 1.020. So we added some yeast holes, shook it up and tried to get it going again. Now, in this particular case, it's not a big deal if it stops. Okay, but I'll get into that in a minute. Let's just see, did it actually keep going? The answer to the question of did it keep going is yes, it absolutely did keep going. Uh, we got it to ferment some more. Let's see. Now, while it didn't go technically fully dry, it did go to 1.004, okay? So that's pretty significant. I'm okay with that. Most people would consider 1.004 to be dry or just off dry. For a mead, it's actually considered dry. If you don't know what any of that means, I did a video on it. Just going over all the guidelines and they are just guidelines. Just saying. Now, if this was our final product, we would probably put this back together, let it sit another week and take another gravity reading just to be sure. Comma, however, we know we're gonna do more stuff to it. That's right. So we're not concerned. We've been calling this a blueberry mead, but there's no blueberry in sight. That's coming. But first, we need to rack this. Before we add the blueberry though, there is something I need to know. See, here's the thing. I know how much blueberry stuff I'm adding, but I don't know how much mead I have. So we're gonna rack into our pitcher with the funky raised letters that are just awesome. And that way we know, and I can calculate our final ABV. If you don't care about the ABV, you can just mix to your heart's content and it's all good. But I actually wanna be able to tell you guys, so that's why we're gonna do it that way. I poured my sample right into the pitcher because I know what'll happen. If I pour it directly into here and all the wispy stuff at the bottom goes all over the place and it makes a mess and then I can't rack it today. And we really wanna rack it today. Speaking of mess, we're leaving the cap on the end of our auto siphon because there is a significant amount. I don't know if you can see it from your point of view, but it goes to roughly about there. Right, and that's that all lease. the lease, all the dead yeast particles and all the sediment that fell out of suspension. We use an auto siphon when racking. Um, I highly recommend investing in one. They're like $20. They last for a while if you get the right one. And we have links to the stuff in the descriptions of almost every one of our videos. And they're, uh, ju they're just great to use. Ours came with a stupid long amount of hose, the, the, the tubing. So we cut it to fit our size. Whoops. Pay attention when you're doing this. Uh, we cut it to fit the size that we like to use. And then, see, pay attention. And then we have some extra tubing that we use for blow off tubes and things like that. Now I'll get to racking and paying attention so Derricka stops giving me that look. So I'm just gonna take a note on how much we have here. We actually have 120 ounces. That's important for what I'm gonna do next, right after we rack it again, back into a little big mouth bubbler so that we can add the next ingredient. Okay, in case you were wondering why we just did a double racking, it's because when it was in the fermenter, it had all the lees in there. If we were to mix this, in there, we'd have this clumpy mess, and then we gotta pasteurize it. Instead, I'd rather keep it clean. Now, we could have done that and let all the sediment settle out after pasteurizing, and it would have been fine. We might have had a little bit more loss that way, I, I'm not sure, but this way, we're going to take our blueberry juice, and yes, that's what this is. It's Nudson's blueberry juice. Here's the ingredients. Filtered water sufficient to reconstitute blueberry juice concentrate. So that's all it is. It's blueberry juice concentrate and water. No ites, no eights, no nothing else. Not that in this case they matter, but I would rather not have any of that junk in my food anyway. So that's me. Now comes the problem of do I just pour this? Do I rack it, siphon it properly? I'm going to pour it, but we're gonna do it very carefully. So if you would tip this sideways for me. Here's the trick to pouring carefully. Now this still has some gas in it, so it's not as big of a deal. You want to just, you gotta commit first. Yeah. And then you can go back to the side and you see uh, there's no sound or very little sound. I'm not causing a splash. You also might be wondering, why do we use blueberry juice instead of whole blueberries or 
dried blueberries or frozen blueberries or any of the other styles of whole fruits that you can use. Because we want to make something simple and a little bit different and unique. So basically what we're doing is flavoring a mead with blueberry. So it's a blueberry flavored mead, if you wanted to be technical, because we didn't ferment any of the blueberry. Now I know what you're thinking. We just added sugars to this. It's going to ferment. No, it's not. We're going to pasteurize it so that it kills off the yeast. And then it just stays exactly where it is right now. But you know what we got to do? We got to take a taste. I need to taste this. And then I need to figure out its alcohol content. So you're going to have to swirly stirry because we didn't stir. I'm going to very carefully stir. It's not going anywhere. She's holding the fermenter like it's going to flip over. Know. Yeah, the baster can flip okay. it over. So it's I'm, habit. I'm a creature of habit. What can you say? Okay. It does have a gorgeous color that will clear out a little bit over time after we pasteurize. Right now, I'm not detecting a lot of blueberry. Keep in mind, we just added it. It needs time to meld. There's a little bit of fl blueberry flavor. I'm sorry, there was a little bit of blueberry smell. It's nice. Needs a little more sweetness, though. I'm betting that juice was 1.050 and broken down among the, you know, four parts roughly. It probably brought it down to like a 1.010. Well, rather than guess, why don't we go ahead and take a reading before we sweeten it further? Okay, we can do that. We'll just take all kinds of readings and it's it's totally okay. I'm not being sarcastic either. Having, reading, having more readings than you need is better than not having them if you want them. But I'm betting you this probably sweetened it to about 1.010, maybe even less because it doesn't taste very sweet to me. And I think blueberry needs to taste sweet. When it's dry, it doesn't taste quite right. So right now, the gravity reading is, as I said, 1.010. So we want to sweeten this a little bit more. I think it could use some, like I said, blueberry should be sweet. Yeah. And then I will figure out the approximate ABV. It'll never be perfect, but we'll try. I'm gonna pour carefully. Barely a ripple. Okay, let me get the sugar. Nope. This is a mead, so we're going to use honey. You know, she's right. Let me get the honey. All right, so we have a technical difficulty, and that being that most of our honey that we have, which we have copious amounts of honey, but they're all crystallizing, mm -hmm. and we're dingbats, and we didn't pre-heat I didn't think we were going to have to sweeten this one. So we're going to be using our sour wood, because yeah. if, you, if you watched our three honey mead test, the sour wood came out a lovely flavor. So we thought that that would be a good addition to There's this. There's some on the lip. Go ahead and grab that. And then she's going to sanitize her finger. Don't worry. Yeah, it is. Is a, it, it has a nice sweetness to it, but it doesn't have any citrus notes or other notes that we feel like are going to get away in the. Yeah, we the had an there. orange blossom, but I didn't think that was the right thing to add. Now, adding honey to this, because it is a mead, makes sense. But it's going to give it more honey character. It's going to give it a little bit more viscosity. And you probably saw, I just poured a bunch in. I didn't really keep track. I mean, this total jar is, it's um, a little over two pounds. It's like two pounds, four ounces. So I put in probably, what, a quarter pound, maybe? Just a little over, maybe? And that's why I wanted Brian to take that initial gravity reading with the addition of the blueberry so we can give you another grad another reading after we're done sweetening it to our taste. So that way you can have an estimate of the difference in gravities to what you might want to do for your sweetening. Okay, so now I'm going to take a, well, no, we're going to take a taste. We're going to take a taste. And we prefer this method of sweetening where it's not so much about the volume you add as the sweetness level that you add. So we taste it in between, and that is what makes the difference. Believe it or not, it smells a little different. I smell a little bit more honey, that's and that's good. important. Yeah. I always make the joke, it smells the same, but when you add honey, it doesn't smell the same, which is why I make that joke. My feeling is this. It's probably about a 1.018 or so sweetness, maybe even a little bit less, 1.0, yeah, 1.018. If we add more honey, we're gonna lose more blueberry. Okay. I think the blueberry character is just strong enough right now. Okay. With the honey, it works. I think if we go further, it's gonna be too much, but it's not as sweet as I would like it to be. That is the truth. So this is where you kind of have to make a little bit of a decision. All right, well, here's something to throw a wrench into the works. If you want to increase the sweetness, but you don't want to dilute 
the flavor, do you want to sweeten more with sugar? You can, or you can sweeten with more blueberries. However, we don't have more of, this, more of that juice. So just going with a real world example, if you didn't have more of that juice, she has a point. We could add sugar to this and it would raise the sweetness level without losing the flavor. And you know what? I like that idea. Let's go with that. Now I know there's at least 10 of you out there right now freaking out, screaming at the screen and typing in nasty comments because we're adding sugar to a mead. But let me explain something. Honey is technically sugar, okay? It has flavors to it that alter things. Right now, we have this balance point of honey character and blueberry character. If we go with one or the other, it's gonna change it. So instead, we're gonna add sugar, which brings nothing to the party but sweetness. It's completely neutral for flavor, realistically. If anything, it'll boost the flavors that are already there. But we chose honey initially because I felt like, and apparently Brian agreed with me, that the honey flavors weren't coming forward enough yep. once we added the blueberry. So now that we have that nice balance between the blueberry and the honey notes, we just want to bump the sugar, the, the sweetness up, and so that's why we went to sugar. Exactly. It's just another tool in your belt not necessarily something you do all the time. We rarely add sugar to mead, to be honest. But like a lot of people will use non-fermentable sugars to sweeten a mead, same concept. I mean, you're just adding sweetness to it. You're not changing the flavors. So we're just using it as a flavoring tool or a non-flavoring tool. Sweetening tool. It's a non-flavoring tool. <laughs> I just had one of those moments where I was like, did I mix it after I added the honey? Yeah, I did. I didn't add that much. I just added probably another quarter pound of sugar, which sugar has a little bit more sugar <laughs> sweetening power than honey does. So I'm betting you we're probably somewhere in the 1.025 or so range right now. I'll have to actually take a reading to find out, but that's just my guess. When I taste it, I'll know better and then be wrong, watch. When you do mix things in, in this state, you wanna be very careful to not splash or cause ripples or oxygenate. You are taking a risk anytime you do something like this, but I'd much rather take a little bit of a risk by making something that I didn't like palatable than putting something that I didn't like on the shelf that I knew was safe. Because I'd never drink it. I don't really hear any more grit. My hand is starting to cramp up. You know what that means? I'm done stirring. All right, so we take another sample smells exactly the same. Apparently she hated it. I would say that it's now sitting at a very nice sweetness level. It's on that border between a sweet versus a dessert, but the blueberry flavor actually got boosted. Yep, 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 yep. I was worried there wasn't enough. Now it's boosted, but I still definitely get honey. I am at the point now where I feel like this is what I envisioned with the blueberry yes. mead. And that's even with the touch of youth that I'm still getting from this. Because this oh, is yeah. still very young and it's, it's lifespan of a, of a mead. Yeah, you got to remember this was started on March 22nd. Today is April 11th. It's three weeks old. All right, so now it's time to take another gravity reading so yes. we can tell you what sweetness level we got to. So for that, I'm going to estimate... I'm going to go with three point, or I'm sorry, three, one. Get your high dominator. I'm going to go with 1.024. I believe that is it. I never bother guessing because A, numbers, and B, whenever you add a fruit to a beverage, your brain tends to elevate the perceived sweetness because fruity notes just trigger the sweetness calibrator in your head so i just like to do it because it's fun yeah okay i was a little bit off it's 1.026 it's off by the two points all right so i am happy with this flavor yes i think this is perfect the way it is so what i would like to do now is pasteurize this and we will pasteurize it right in this container yeah. i'm just going to pour the sample back in carefully we have a video on full gallon pasteurization, so I'll make sure to link that in the description below. But there is one more thing that they probably want to know. What's our ABV? Ooh, How yeah. much alcohol is in here now? Now, I intentionally 
worked on diluting this, I intentionally worked with a little bit higher gravity when we started this. So using the calculator the teacher said would never be handy, I'm going to figure this out. So we had a 1.108 to start, right? It ended at 1.004. So 1.108 minus 1.004 gives us 0 0.104, multiply that by 135, and I get 14.04%. Now. now, for some of you who are confused about our abundance of gravity readings that we took after that, those had nothing to do with fermentation. Those were for changing our sweetness levels. Right. So those don't play any factor in figuring out our ABV. But what does is we started with 120 ounces of 14% mead and 32 ounces of 0% blueberry juice. So the way I do that is it's basically just an equation. I use 120 parts, so 120 times 14.04 equals 1684.8, but that doesn't matter, plus 32 of zero. So 32 times zero is still just 32. Oh, well, it's 32 times one, because that would be the gravity is one. So we go with that. Now I divide by the total amount, which would be 152 divided by 152 gives me 11.29%, so 11.3% ABV at the end. This ends up at 11.3%, which is respectable for a mead. They're anywhere between like 8 to 15 is like a normal mead. And um, we're going to pasteurize this like we said. Then we are going to put it back on the shelf for a little while, let it settle out, because the pasteurization process invariably will help clear this. And it'll mellow the flavors a little bit, might, might make things meld a little bit better, and then we'll be back to give you our final idea on the tasting. It's been sitting for a week, letting it clear out. It looks pretty good. It's very, very dark, so it's hard to tell for sure. But it's time to taste this, put a score on it, and then pack it away for a year. Let's see, see if it gets better. It has a beautiful color. It did clear really, really nicely red. Weird, they call them blueberries, but yet they're red. It's gorgeous. Okay, can we just set that lid on top of there while we're Absolutely. talking and stuff? So, as I was saying, on the color, it's absolutely beautiful. Gem-like quality, it's a 10 for clarity as far as I'm it's concerned. Beautiful. On the smell, get a little bit of the young note, a little bit of young note. But I definitely get some honey and I get some fruitiness. Yeah, it's like that sharp, tart fruitiness. Yep. yep. Now, the more I'm exploring it on the nose, I'm getting more of the blueberry note coming through. Yep. It's like you need to acclimate to that ethanol. What's the ABV on this? I think we said it's something in the... 11.3? Where do you see 11.3? Is that what that is right there? Yeah. What do you know? I actually wrote it down. Okay, so that's interesting that there's a strong an ethanol note in the nose. But once you start smelling it... It's blueberry. Yeah, it's blueberry and honey, just without We're a doubt. going in. Yeah, I agree. That. That is awesome. <laughs> that is so good. It has all the right notes. It's got the slight tanginess of a blueberry but it has the sweetness and freshness of fresh fruit blueberries. And it's got the honey. And it's like you drizzled honey over flesh, fre flesh blueberries. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different kind of blueberry there. Um, but yeah, it's like you had a bowl of blueberries and you just poured some honey over it and that's when you're... Ah. Mm. It's rich and viscous without being cloying. It's not overly sweet and it's not even like super thick. It's no. It's got a good mouthfeel without it's, being too much. It's a perfect viscosity for what I feel a mead should feel like. Yep. What's really interesting is I'm getting an odd after breath taste, almost like wheat. Mm. Do you get that? We got it on the buckwheat honey blueberry cider that we did years and years ago. Yeah. And I'm wondering. It's kind of like. Now this is sweet squeeze wildflower. Shades of beer. It's a very mild thing, though. Yeah, I really wasn't noticing it until he mentioned it. It doesn't it. take away. No. 
In fact, I think it adds to the experience. It, it adds another dimension. Mm -hmm. um, wow. I mean, how, how else do you say it? It tastes like blueberry mead should taste. Yeah. This and is that, so much better I, than the first one our, that we made. Our first reaction was just like, because there it is. That's, it, it's, it's lovely. And I know this probably sounds weird, but it's lovely when your oh, yeah. intent, your, your vision, Take your that. aspirations all come together and, and you just drink it and you're like, that's exactly what I wanted. Because normally we come pretty close. We've gotten really close a few times. Uh, but I think now... The sangria was a good one. Oh, the sangria was beautiful. The was, fine wine was another, was another good one. Another, this is what I was was hoping for and here it is and you know this is part of the experience of home brewing many people will make the same recipe 5 10 20 times to perfect it and i have zero issue with that we end up doing that too over time but i don't want to make it and then make it again and make it again and make it again and then only film the last one i'd rather show you guys hey this was our beta test you it's know what i mean the process yeah and because nothing we've made is undrinkable except for maybe the nettle one that one was kind of mm. But everything along the way has been great. Like good stuff, decent, drinkable meads. Every I, once in a while, one is just stellar. I think our new improved method of continuing the process. Yeah, we don't give up. Starting with our base concept and then continuing mm -hmm. to reach that, that end goal, that ideal perfection. I think that has really helped our final product. Mm -hmm. and oh, absolutely. Helped us think about things slightly differently. So it's not just like, okay, well, that's what it is. It is what it is. No. Well, also, because now we're doing it all in one video, too. Um, it used to be, I mean, the longtime watchers will know, we used to put out three, four, five, sometimes six videos for each brew, and it got difficult to find them all. But the reason we stopped doing that is because we would make it and then release that. Then we would do the first check and release that, do the second check and release that. And what would happen is, what if that brew wasn't so great? Now somebody else that was following along with us, yeah. they have done everything we did. And if it wasn't that great, we kind of led them astray. I mean, a little, you know, but buyer beware, of course. But by doing it all in one video, you're not as likely to have started it by the time you finish the video. So you can go, yeah. okay, that one they did not like. I'm not doing it that way or that one they really like, I wanna do that. So that way you get to see our trials and, and errors and everything in between. Yeah. And I don't know, it just keeps it more real. I, I think it, it's an adventure. You know, we're just as surprised as you are how things are gonna turn out sometimes. <laughs> um, and there's, there's multiple ways of coming towards the same concept. Uh, when you add the fruit, what style of fruit you're adding, mm -hmm. you know, if you're adding chemicals, if you're avoiding chemicals, it, all these different things, there's no <laughs> right way and yeah. there's no wrong way as long as you don't create something bad for you. There's the right way for you. Right. And, and it, what we try to stress here, and I think sometimes it gets lost in our exuberance, perhaps. Is you're that, exuberant, I'm not. Is that... We want you to know, we want you to understand the process, and we want you to understand when something is appropriate to add, when something is not appropriate to add, and what it's going to do to your brew. As long as you have that information, then you can go, oh, well, the fruit that I want to use isn't in season, but I have frozen variety, and that's going to work fine, or I have a dried variety, and that's going to be fine, and these are the different steps that I need to do to create what I have envisioned as my final product. And so that that's that's our hope to instill in you is to give you as much knowledge as possible so you have the choice. You have the opportunity to use what's available to you and create something that you're gonna enjoy. It goes back to an article that I wrote uh, many years ago that I think is still in our blog. Are you a how or are you a why? Because there's lots of people on the internet that will say, here is how you do something. Step A, B, C, D, E, and F. And if you follow these steps, you'll be successful and it'll be great. Done. I'm sorry. And we could do a mead video in under seven minutes, because we showed it, on how to do that. But it didn't explain why. And that, I think, is far more important. If you understand why you need to do step A, and why step A included step B, and step C, and D, and E, and F, and how all those things are conjoined together, and why what you did in A might affect F, that means we've taught you something, not just said, here, do this. So that's kind of a different scenario, and that's why we like to call ourselves a teaching channel, because we're, we're 
It's teaching you how to fish, basically. <laughs> Instead of giving you a fish, we're teaching you how to fish. Because here's the thing. If we could open a meadery with a reasonable amount of time and effort involved, we would. And then we'd sell you mead. Yeah. But instead, we're teaching you how to make it for yourself. Yeah. To me, they're just opposite sides of the same coin, but unique business, unique concept. And that's what we like to do is we're both teachers. We always have been in some way or form. Derek yeah. did it officially. I did it unofficially, but... You did it officially too. Uh, yeah. Once you were in the teaching yeah, circuit. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Uh, as a photographer, yeah. not as a... Right. But and now I've done it officially as a, as a meat maker. Oh, wow. <laughs> Things change. But anyway, we've gone off on a long enough tangent, but you guys are used to that by now, that uh, it's time to put a score on this, I think. Do you have a score ready? I have an illegal score, but I'm going to maneuver it to a legal score. What she means by that is our scoring system goes from 1 through 10, with 11 being reserved for only the most amazing of greatest things. That's right, ours does go to 11. And one is absolute crap. It means you probably dump it and it's probably vile and disgusting. You wouldn't give it to your worst enemy. 10 is like the best thing you've made. It came out exactly the way you want. It's just perfect for you. 11 is like just a notch above. It's that exceptional thing that doesn't come along very often. We go half points. That's the illegal thing she's yeah, talking about. She right. wants to go three quarters or quarter point. I do. I know. But I know. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Are you ready? Ah, uh, yes. One, two, three, ten point five. <laughs> That's right. This is not an eleven. This is not an eleven. It is so close to an eleven. But it's better than a ten. But yeah, yeah. But I went. I I went. You're to being do, very conservative. I'm being very conservative. I know. I don't know why. We have a lot of tens on this we, channel. We got a lot going on. And I usually give higher scores than you, anyway. I wanted to give this a nine point seven five. See. Uh, only because I wanted to give it some room to go higher for the one year. And, and that's like what we're, we're waiting for. Well, yeah, I can I can understand that. But because I judge it as it is, this, not for what it could be. This would be absolute perfection if that little tiny youthness was gone. See, after a while, I don't taste the youth, youthfulness anymore. By the time I had the second, you know, two little oh, ice yeah. pour. Okay, could I drink all of this right now oh, and regret yeah. it tomorrow? Yes, absolutely. But I wouldn't regret it today. Today, so, I'd be very happy. So are you saying that you would be willing to raise your score to a 10? Oh, uh, yeah. Look at that. 10 and 10.5. That's awesome. Considering the last one we made, I reviewed some of the footage on the one year, which you saw some of it in this video. I think I raised my score to a nine after we added honey in the, glass in the glass to sweeten it up. Yeah. This, straight out of the bottle, at only a few weeks old, um, yeah, this is like, oh wow, this, <laughs> it's not even four weeks old yet. And I'm giving it a 10.5. This is literally just under four weeks. Lovely. At a year, this might be our first 12. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, the scale will just keep going up and up and up. You know. We can go to a million, maybe. Ah. Power creep. It's, it's a thing. It's if you watch video thing. games or play video games, you know what power creep is. And it's, it's just... All right. Fun. So we're going to bottle this now. Yep. But that's boring. However, if you want to <laughs> watch how we bottle and learn our process, link in the description below to that video. And if you can't find that video or you found that video to be too boring and you want me to make a new one, let me know in the comments below and we'll work on making a new version even more silly and crazy, but it'll probably only be like three to four minutes long. So, you know, there's that. Let us know. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.